Hello and welcome to our online event, Wellbeing as a Goal of Public Policy, hosted by the School of Public Policy and Beverage 2.0, Redefining the Social Contract Initiative. My name is Julia Black. I'm the Strategic Director of Innovation and a Professor of Law in the Department of Law at LSE. And I'm very pleased to be chairing this event today. I'm delighted to be welcoming Steve Baker, MP, uh, and Nancy Hay virtually to the LSE and to be joined by my LSE colleagues, Professor Paul Dolan and Dr. Johanna Thomas. So this event marks the launch of the LSE Public Policy Review issue on well-being. The LSE Public Policy Review is a new journal which is published by LSE Press, which is our online press and managed by the School of Public Policy. Um, and the link to the journal will be shared in the chat or you can access it by searching LSE Public Policy Review um, just online. So the wellbeing issue tackles the topic from a range of different disciplinary perspectives, from economics to political science, psychological and behavioral science through to philosophy. And we've got a fantastic lineup of authors, including Richard Layard, Liam Delaney, Annette Bauer, Sarah Hagerman, Chris Anderson, Paul Anand, Mika Matila, and of course, Paul and Johanna, who's are here today. Past issues of the review have covered topics such as populism, COVID-19 pandemic, with articles by LSE authors with, again, a number of different disciplinary perspectives and all reflecting on policy implications. Our next issue is focusing on lessons from Afghanistan. So before I introduce our speakers, I have a few announcements. Um, so for those on Twitter, uh, using Twitter, then the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Public Policy. The event is being recorded and we should be making it available as a podcast, hopefully. Just in terms of the format for the event, so we've got after the speakers' presentations and some follow-up questions, perhaps from me and across the panel, I'm going to open the floor to Q&A. And when we get to the Q&A portion of the event, just to submit your questions, if you could just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you use the Q&A function rather than the chat, Q&A function. So questions will be submitted in and we'll uh, try and deal with uh, or answer and get responses to as many of those as possible. If you could just let us know your name and affiliation, that would be helpful, but obviously you don't need to do that. So, right, let me now introduce our speakers. So we have delighted to welcome uh, Steve Baker. So Steve Baker is a Conservative MP for Wickham, former minister and the deputy chairman of the COVID recovery group. Steve is going to kick us off. Uh, and then we're going to be turning to Professor Paul Dolan, who's a professor at the LSE, Professor of Behavioral Science at LSE. Then turning to Dr. Johanna Thoma, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method at LSE. And then Nancy, delighted that Nancy Hay is here to join us as well. And Nancy is Executive Director of the What Work Centre for Wellbeing. So we have a huge amount to get through, fascinating topic. Um, and so without further ado, Steve, I'm going to ask you to, to kick us off. Julia, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's here. I can see it's a really well attended panel and it's a real privilege to be able to speak with you. I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A. So thank you very much indeed for being here. I want to really make uh, three points. And the first one is to say that I approach this from a position of scepticism. You know, nothing's more likely to harm my well-being than the news that the government wants to make me happy. Uh, so when Paul Dolan reached out to me during this crisis, I was pretty sceptical to hear from the happiness professor because I was rather worried that he'd be explaining to me the benefits of everybody living in the embrace of the state and the wise professors deciding how to make us happy. So I was extremely sceptical, but Paul and I did a number of, we had a couple of private calls and then we did a number of uh, video clips which we put out. And a really transformational moment for me was when I realised that what Paul was really proposing was serious analysis of which public policy could best deliver lifelong well-being because of course all of us who are pragmatists in politics know that actually yeah well-being is the goal of public policy and we may disagree in the margins or sometimes quite fundamentally but the fundamental parameters of what the state does are pretty fixed and we need to seriously consider how we make decisions and how we uh, channel scarce resources so just a point on that before I move on. We're in a really extraordinary position just now. If you consider universal credit, I'm very pleased having campaigned for it, that we've increased the work allowance, we've improved the taper rate. But what we haven't done is uh, keep the 20 pound a week uplift because at about six billion pounds a year, that's too expensive. 
But at the moment, we're spending about twenty-four billion pounds a year testing people, and 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 that includes testing asymptomatic people. I'd love to have a cross-benefit analysis on well-being at this stage of the pandemic on that decision, because it feels to me intuitively like keeping the uplift would be better for well-being than testing asymptomatic children in school, for example. But I'd love to really know uh, and be able to make the case that actually we've made. Uh, we could better make a different choice. So that's the first point, is I do come to this uh, from a position of scepticism as a sort of classical liberal conservative. I'm pretty sceptical about state power, but I'm pragmatic enough to recognise, I hope, that we do need to take serious decisions with great frameworks. So then the second point is, I think that the pandemic has shown in these acute circumstances just how important it is to have good decision-making frameworks. I had somebody only yesterday say to me from a position of some authority privately, um, say that it turned out we didn't have a good decision making framework. You know, I, I, I don't mind saying that I had a private conversation at one point with Matt Hancock and I asked him, how does the system reconcile these competing tensions, particularly I happened to raise the curfew, the tension between public health professionals wanting to shut restaurants and the need for them to survive by getting two covers through a table. Who, who, who reconciles these different competing tensions? And the answer was that the prime minister does it when the cabinet meets. And it seems to me that that is a wholly unacceptable way. Relying on the prime minister in the heat of the meeting seems to me wholly the wrong way to consider some of the things which come up. So I'm not going to go through them all, the 20 of them, but Paul, Paul introduced me to the idea that, I mean, of checklists and actually that comes from from my point of view from aerospace you know I've, as an aerospace engineer i've seen check, checklists over many years but paul's checklists of things we should consider includes 20 items and it would have been a start if all 20 of those things had been considered at each major decision making stage in this process but actually it's turned out it's quite often fallen to the prime minister to maybe raise what will be the impact on restaurants and, and, and it's way too late by that stage. So that's the second point is that in the acute circumstances of the pandemic, I think we've really revealed the need for the kind of well-being based cost benefit analysis, which could have better informed the trade offs which were made, particularly in relation to non pharmaceutical interventions, in other words, taking away people's freedoms in order to try and uh, protect their well-being from the disease. So really important stuff, and I've really welcomed what Paul's had to say about it. But moving beyond the pandemic, third point is, we have got some really serious chronic problems. I think it's not only shaming for me and my government, but also shaming for the entire welfare state that the food bank in Wickham is something of an industrial operation. I take some small pride that it's been run until recently, the chairman was from my church and, you know, other people involved with the food bank have come out of my church. It's lovely that we've been doing our social duty. But really, at this stage of the development of the welfare state, if you date it from, say, the 1911 National Insurance Act, we really ought not to be in a position where people in South Buckinghamshire need to go to food banks. So I think there's a really important job to be done here. And I'm really pleased that Beverage 2.0 appears in this report, because actually, again, from a classical liberal point of view, I think Beverage said many great things which the welfare state didn't honour. So for example, seeking to extend the benefits of friendly societies to everybody, which perhaps for another time. But I think from if we're to take a Beverage 2.0 sort of context to what we're talking about, I really think it is overdue to apply a serious framework to the trade-offs made, for example, in spending reviews, so that we can start to deal with the really chronic problems of the welfare state, failing to lift out of poverty the people it's supposed to help. You know, 10 years, 12 years ago, the, one of the first things I did when I got into politics was give quite a lot of time to the Centre for Social Justice. They had their Breakthrough Britain report following on from the Breakdown Britain analysis, we intended to solve all these intergenerational problems of social justice. We haven't done it. And that's why, actually, I'm quite excited to discover that Paul Dolan doesn't want us all living in the embrace of the state, but does want us to have a better decision making framework. And actually, I'm really excited by the possibilities. So, Juliet, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say and what the questions are. Fantastic, Steve. Thank you so much for getting us off to such a such a brilliant start. Lots of very, very uh, interesting and important points there. OK, Paul, I'm going to I'm going to hand over to you now. Yeah, thank you very much, Julia. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for, you know, sort of teaming me up so well there, Steve, I think. So I'm going to I think the title of my paper is about consequences and about claims. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about both of those things without mentioning the other C word, uh, at least until the discussion. Um, because whether we're in calm times or in times of crisis, um, we should be doing policy better. Um, and the, the two main ways in which we do that, um, and I think the first is to measure the impacts of what we're doing more completely, more fully, and actually just even at all. Um, I've used an analogy many times of when you drop a pebble into a pond, it has an initial splash, but there's also significant ripple effects downstream. And similarly, when we drop a pebble of a policy into the pond or a great big fucking stone, as we've done over the last two years, we would want to not only capture the initial splash, but also every possible effect that that will have downstream over time. Now, of course, unlike the flow of water, the welfare effects of public policy are difficult to measure, um, but they're not impossible to measure. And put simply, we can measure those effects in two main ways. We can measure them by the impact on people's life experiences, that is how well they live, and we can measure them by their impact on their life expectancies, that is how long they live. Now, for anyone who's read Happiness by Design, and if you haven't by now, why not? Um, you'll know that I talk about well-being as the flow of pleasure and purpose over time. So ideally, we would be measuring the impacts of our public policies on the flow of those twin experiences over time. And the over time bit is important because our lives go better when they're better, but also when they last longer, assuming that they're also better. Um, so conscious of time, I want to move on to claims. Um, the simple point just about the impacts is that we should be measuring them. And even if we started with a simple checklist approach that Steve mentioned earlier, we would be making quite significant advances on what we've done, I think, over the last two years or so. Um, but the consequences are not the only part of the story. And I want to move on to uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about claims. And what I mean here is the legitimate reason why a group or an individual might have a claim to scarce public money. Um, I would imagine that most people have seen Shrek. And you know when the donkey is jumping up and down and he's saying, pick me, pick me. What we can think of claims as is the size of the hand going up when, the, when you sort of jump up and down, right? So the more, the more you can raise your hand, the more you can jump in the air, the more you have a claim to public resources. Imagine being in a queue for scarce public money. What would bump you up the queue? How hard and how high you can raise your hand? So what are the legitimate claims that we have as individuals or as groups on public monies? Well, the first is, is, mentioned, is, is actually captured by what I said by way of outcomes, is that the more you have to gain from an intervention, the more you can claim all else equal so if i might be expected to get another 10 minutes of happiness or well-being i would have less of a claim than someone who might be expected to get 10 years and that would be a simple utilitarian calculus it would be saying claims based on capacity to benefit those who get the most those who can be expected to get the most get bumped up the queue can put their hands up the highest well, we know that that's not the only thing that matters. And there, there, are, there are a few other things that I talk about in the paper. I'm going to I'm just draw attention to two more significant claims. Um, and you can make your own inferences about what implications that might have for how we would have dealt with the pandemic over the last couple of years. Or actually, in fact, how we might deal with any public policy when we drop the stone of intervention into the pond. Um, the second legitimate claim, then, is the severity of the condition in the absence of intervention. So not just your expected profile from what you might expect to gain, but also what you might get in the absence of that intervention. So, for example, if someone was going to be dying imminently, they would get a greater priority than someone who might expect to live for another 10 years. All else equal. And now you can actually now start seeing, even with only these two claims, how they might come into tension with one another. We have a classic trade-off, therefore, between capacity to benefit on the one hand and the severity of the condition on the other hand. 
Now, the third and final claim that I want to mention before I wrap up is in relation to lifetime well-being. When we're thinking about, just think about the income distribution for a second. Would you want to just know how much somebody earned this last week or this last month or this last year when you were looking at the fairness or otherwise of the income distribution? Well, the answer is obviously no. You would want to know what their expected lifetime earnings would be. You might want to know what their expected wealth would be. You might want to know how many assets they have. You wouldn't just take a snapshot picture of any one moment in time to assess how well or badly an individual was doing. You would take a lifetime. So ideally, we should be looking at the lifetime. It's the lifetime that we should be paying attention to. And when I trained as a health economist three decades ago now, nearly, um, I worked at the University of York with Alan Williams, who was a, a very strong advocate. He was in his 70s at that point. He was a very strong proponent of the fair innings argument. And the fair, fair innings argument is simply that the more of a long and rich life, the more of the life experiences and life expectancies you've had, all else equal, the less priority you would get in the race for scarce resources. The less of that, you know, let me frame that differently. The less of that you've had, the poorer your life experience is, the less your life expectancy, the more you can put your hand up. The more you would be bumped to the front of the queue because not only in terms of what you might expect into the future might be more, but what you've already had is less. And I'm going to, and I'm going to conclude on that point because I'm, I'm just going to leave that because there will be obviously things that we will pick up more fully when we think about what impact public policy over the last two years have had on the distribution of lifetime well-being. Um, but my simple conclusion then is that we should be measuring the outcomes. And by the way, it's worth saying that even, even if you don't, every policy is implicitly affecting life experiences and life expectancy. So you can't say, you know, some people might say we don't want single metrics. We don't want to, you know, express things in a single number. Well, that's fine. But implicitly, we're doing things that are expressed in that single metric. So, so the real issue is then at what level and to what degree do you want to quantify some of these kinds of trade-offs? That's the controversialist point. The second point is the donkey in Shrek. Who can put their hands up to claim the public money the most? And we want to allocate the, the scarce monies that we have in a way that is both efficient and fair. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. So a lot for us to, to pick up on there. And you know, and obviously not only picking up on, on issues of efficiency, which economists are very good at doing, but issues of fairness, which is somewhere it tends to sort of step outside their bailiwick and more step more into kind of issues about distributional justice, et cetera. So really interested to hear your perspective on, on, on some of these issues. Uh, great. So, sorry, should I start? I, I didn't hear yes. Me. Okay, great. Uh, I've got some slides to share. Um, do this and uh, to full screen mode. Right. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so, I was invited to this as a philosophical commentator, and um, it's like Steve. I came to this as a um, as a skeptic, and I remained uh, somewhat of a skeptical uh, skeptic. And so, for the um, purposes of debate, I'll lay out some of those um, critical remarks that you can read on in more detail in my paper. So the proposal on the table that's discussed in this whole issue um, goes roughly like this. We want to aggregate all the effects of policies, both in the short term and in the long term, into a single metric. And ideally, this should be well-bees or subjective well-being adjusted life years. Another important feature of it is um, what Paul just explained in terms of um, claims and the donkey and Shrek we can account for distributional concerns by equity weighting our cost benefit analysis or cost effectiveness analysis where we can give more or less weight to the well-being of some say we count your well-being for more if you are relatively worse off than other people and lastly in context where there's risk or uncertainty we uh, choose on the basis of expected effects as they're captured in a 
cost benefit analysis um, or cost effectiveness analysis. So we weight um, uncertain effects by their probabilities. Now, what this proposal instantiates is a, an idea that's been around for some time in the social sciences, an idea that's been called by a colleague of mine, the dream of a master number, uh, so it was Anna Alexandrova at Cambridge. Um, and the dream is some sort of inspired by this idea that we want to measure that is comprehensive, that takes into account everything that might matter. And because it is comprehensive, because it takes into account everything, it can give direct action guidance to policymakers. Um, it is, uh, gives a sort of rational uh, basis for making decisions that lead to what is supposed to be the one goal of policy, namely increasing well-being. Um, and I think that dream should be abandoned, that dream of a master number, and I want to explain why. And it's based on this observation that a well-being-based approach, just like any single metric approach to policy evaluation, must take side on many contentious moral questions. Just to highlight some of the most important ones, there's the question of what is well-being? And broadly speaking, the um, account uh, laid out by Paul is that um, it's a subjective account of, um, of well-being um, and it's a hedonistic one where it's about pleasurable experiences or purposeful experiences. Um, then there's the question is well-being everything that matters? And the account must say, well, at least for the purposes of constructing this metric, it is all that matters. Um, and in so far as we think other things might matter, that is giving up on the idea that this is really a comprehensive measure. Um, how should equality be taken into account? In this account, it's equity weight weighting the well-bees. How should we evaluate options involving risk? We maximize expected well-bees by weighting everything by probabilities. Now, these are all questions that reasonable, thoughtful, and well-informed people disagree about. Um, I mean, as a philosopher, I can say there have been millennia of, of discussions on some of these questions, and there doesn't seem to be much of a consensus inside. Uh, even within the specific answers that I've given here, there's a lot of room for disagreement, say, when we talk about equity weighting, what exactly should the equity weights be, for example, and my paper goes into one, of, uh, one ambiguity here um, in the context of risk. So even within these answers, there's a lot of um, room for disagreement about this, exactly how the framework should be implemented. Um, but uh, on top of that, there are some people who would quite fundamentally disagree with these um, answers to these fundamental questions. So some alternatives to a hedonistic account of well-being is that instead of pleasurable experience, what matters is that people's desires are fulfilled, whether they desire to have pleasurable experiences or not. Or you might think that um, there are some things that are just objectively good for people, um, no matter whether they get pleasure out of them or whether they desire them, such as, for instance, education or knowledge. Um, some people think that well-being is not all that matters. Additional things that might matter um, could be freedom or, say, the preservation of the environment for its own sake. Um, and, and I think this is an important point. Um, it's sometimes presented as if the equity weighting could take into account um, all of the concerns that egalitarians might have. But actually, there are, there are all sorts of other things that egalitarians tend to care about. They tend to care about the distribution of things other than well-being, for instance, about the distribution of resources. So they might think that it is a bad thing that some people have much more than others, even if rich people um, were generally unhappy. Or uh, they might think that the distribution of capabilities or opportunities for well-being um, might matter or that really what matters is not the distribution of anything at all but that we have social relationships of equality with one another um, and finally when it comes to risk um, some people might advocate for more risk averse approaches than maximizing the expectation of well-being uh, so for instance those who um, argue in favor of precautionary principles or weighting more heavily um, unlikely but especially bad potential outcomes but the important point is, these are questions that people tend to disagree about. So the point is not that the answers to these questions are wrong in the framework, or that any of the alternatives is correct, but rather um, that these are very contentious moral questions, and a single metric approach must settle on, on answers to them. So what do you do with reasonable disagreement? Well, in a sense, this is kind of the found foundational uh, problem of politics, right, that we have to make decisions even though 
people disagree on fundamental questions of values and policymakers have to make decisions in the face of reasonable disagreement all the time. Now in liberal democracies, usually how we approach decision making in the context of reasonable disagreement is that we say policymakers have to strive to make decisions that are justifiable to all where possible. So this is sometimes called the ideal of public reason. We might achieve it in some cases where we just leave things up to individuals where their choices affect mainly them. Um, but often it's not possible to make choices that are justifiable to all. But there we might agree that at least there's some pro procedures that everybody can agree on. And we can get procedural legitimacy by having decisions be made by democratically elected representatives after informed public debate that is open to public scrutiny. Now, the question is, uh, if the well-being approach, as I've argued, captures just one of the reasonable perspectives one might have on what matters, what role can and should it play in such a process? And I think there's a, there's a danger here um, that, is, um, that has three parts. One is that the value judgments that it, it embeds are not justifiable to all. And the single metric comes with a danger of hiding the controversial choices that are being made in its construction, which is not to say that these choices aren't part of the public record, but they might be difficult to detect for anybody who's not an insider to um, health econo uh, to, to um, uh, happiness economics. Um, and there's a danger when there's just a single metric that what's being reported to the public is really just the bottom line. So there's a, there's a danger of controversial choices being hidden. Um, and moreover, institutionally privileging it as a decision-making tool that is sort of as a mechanistic device um, embedded into the institutions of government comes with the danger of circumventing public debate and de democratic decision-making. So this is a danger that is sort of at the inter interaction point between social scientists and policymakers. Um, so I want to finish with some thoughts on what I think uh, the proper role for social scientists should be, given that in, um, when it comes to policy relevant questions, social science, of course, can't help to be value laden. So what should the proper role be for social scientists then? And I think there are two main options for social scientists. Um, uh, that help them to help rather than undermine democracy. The first would still involve producing what I've called a master number that can be directly action guiding, um, but that would have to in involve working closely with the public and democratically elected officials to devolve as much as possible all important value judgments. Now, I think that this is a non-starter. For one, because it would be a really massive undertaking. Um, so this is not just about asking people about very specific parts of the framework, say, how exactly should we set the equity weights? But really for this to have democratic legitimacy, we'd have to ask people about all of the important value judgments that go into the framework. And I've just gone through um, just how, how many they are and what large questions they're involved here. So I think it's sort of practically um, impossible to achieve um, democratic devolvement of, of all of these important value questions. And moreover, I think it's, it's fairly unlikely that it would yield anything like the well-be approach. So you only have to look at some results in experimental philosophy to see that uh, people are often unwilling to make the kinds of trade-offs that a well-be framework um, or in health economics, a um, quality-based framework would um, require us to make. So if we really do ask people about everything, we might not actually get um, anything like the well-being approach. Um, and I think the second option is thus the, um, the better way to go, and it would involve the social scientific community as a whole producing multiple metrics that can serve as inputs to public deliberation and democratic decision making. Um, and this would achieve comprehensiveness in a wider sense that everybody, no matter what their most fundamental value commitments are, has some social science they can result on, so, uh, rely on, some metrics they can appeal to when we then have a public debate about which values should matter more in a specific policy context. So the community as a whole should produce multiple metrics. Um, now, within this kind of um, approach, individual scientists can still endorse specific metrics, including comprehensive ones like the well-being based approach. But I want to end with a call for greater care if this is the way 
we want to approach thing, things because then individual scientists would have to make sure that all the value judgments involved are made explicit to the public and policymakers that the metric is explicitly presented as only one of several reasonable ways of evaluate, evaluating policy options and that different value judgments could lead to different evaluations. And finally, we'd have to be very careful about how we advocate for our favorite framework. It should be part of and doesn't sidestep public deliberation, so we shouldn't argue for our framework to um, have this kind of privileged institutional um, or privileged um, isn't privileged as a sort of mechanistic tool that governments use as a default, but rather that if we as social scientists propose a particular metric, um, this is input into public deliberation. And we're sort of, we're ourselves part of the public discussion. And uh, this is it. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, Johanna, you've given us a huge amount of food of thought for thought there. Um, and so whilst we're, whilst we're processing that and digesting that, I'm going to turn to Nancy now for her thoughts and reflections on, on some of the, um, the comments that have been made by, by our panellists so far. Nancy. So this is a fantastic discussion and thank you for having me. It's actually a really rich one. Um, so from my perspective, the aim of collective action and in public sector or civil society is to improve people's lives. And we use the term well-being for that um, the different terms are used in a range of different contexts but we often forget this when we're talking about uh, different policy choices that we're making that the end goal of the various policy choices whether in different different um, well in DCMS or Ministry of Justice or the the Treasury the, the, the purpose is is to improve people's lives and we're making decisions about what government does and doesn't do and how it does it um, and so where I came at this whole question was about how do you make good laws, you need good policies, you need good policies, well how do you understand the impact that you had, and um, one of the classic conflicts is that uh, the data that you have doesn't meet the democratic experience of the elected minister, and they go well that's not what it's like where I am, and these lived experience measures are really really helpful in capturing the broad range of experience that people have, and I think it should be available really broadly alongside other measures as well to help us understand it but let me show you a little bit about what happened to the subjective well-being measures in the UK over the last couple of well last 10 years actually I can show you so um, I'm going to start from the beginning so we just get uh, a view that works here yeah. we so um, that's why I'm director of the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. So we're an independent collaborating centre bringing together the evidence of, of what organisations can do in any sectors, whether that's government, business, third sector or academia, or how we can understand what organisations can do to improve wellbeing um, with a big focus in the UK. And that's because we've got this, 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 well, this what is called a wellbeing measurement framework, but actually it's a full picture of how we're doing as individuals, communities and as a nation and how sustainable that is for the future. So thinking of that as a broad understanding of our national accounts, so our economic, social, and environmental um, experience of, of life in how UK is doing. And in particular, it has, it has 10 domains of life, both objective and subjective measures in all of those areas, whether we are safe, crime rates, whether we feel safe, but it also has these subjective wellbeing measures that um, Paul talks about in terms of our experience of life, our purpose, our happiness and our and our anxiety. These aren't the only measures you can use, but they are really quite good at capturing the breadth of things that matter to us in life. And, and we can see that over the last 10 years, we've been collecting this data on all those four metrics. We can see gentle improvements in 2011, 12, and then a big drop immediately when the pandemic hit on all of the measures, except anxiety, which is the bottom right, where we saw actually the biggest <laughs> biggest increase we've ever seen and actually that increase was not evenly distributed if you were anxious about money or worried about your job you were more likely to feel anxious and you were more like you were actually fairly likely to be accurate about whether or not you should be worried um, so that's the immediate impact of the pandemic on those metrics and then we can see that we're broadly starting to recover at the different stages of those things so we, we do bounce back against lots of things so helping understand what we adapt to and what we don't adapt to is really important 
uh, and we can start to see the changes over the time and then more recently we can see that happiness or the positive affect the mood one uh, has gone back up it moves more quickly uh, as does the anxiety one but purpose this eudaimonic measure didn't move as much but it is slightly lower but all of these become quite important and the reason I like the the life satisfaction measure is because it picks up things that are have always been important to public policy but in a way that we can share it so we know that economics and employment and money is important we know that our health and our life expectancy is important but our relationships are all important and all of those three things are strongly captured by that we can see um, how well-being is doing across the different parts of the country and we know different places experience the pandemic differently and you can see that for different local authorities across the UK as well um, and what drives that this is the life satisfaction driver um, but we can certainly see that some things matter more than others uh, and therefore and uh, therefore those are the things that ought to be prioritized and then the other things can help make a difference and we can start to wait these multi-metric um, approaches in ways that help us think about the different impacts of policy can have on people's lives now and in the future. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to say, um, we've also looked at where people are struggling most across the UK, uh, and this is where people are in real misery. So this distribution of wellbeing really matters. This is people who score not to four, all of those four subjective wellbeing measures. So this is proper low wellbeing. We can map that across the country and we can understand the drivers of that. And we can see where half a million people in the country have the lowest wellbeing. And we can also see where the highest. But I want to say, um, I'm gonna stop sharing the slides now um, because I wanted to add a few more comments to that. So. One of the things is this, that all of those metrics are actually really quite useful for understanding. So we did the first ever population level analysis of what makes life worthwhile, this purpose measure. And this is where things like faith, looking after the home, volunteering and education and learning start to come out more strongly, as well as these other ones. But we really do need a framework that works in times of calm because in times of crisis, we need to respond really quickly. When the bad weather hits, you need to have a way of making decisions that everybody understands really quickly. Um, and at least, I mean, decisions will be made regardless. We have to make decisions, we respond to events, but we should have the best possible information that helps inform that, that everybody can play a part in that response. So that'd be my immediate uh, reaction to how uh, wellbeing can be used in public policy. Brilliant. Nancy, thank you so much. Um, and really some really interesting data as well that you presented. Uh, you presented there. So listen, I've got I've got loads of questions. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pose a, put some of my questions first. I'm going to utterly and utterly abuse my position as chair uh, to, to jump ahead of the queue. But so I but I am urging everybody who's uh, who's listening and who's with us today just to be putting your questions um, in the Q&A box and we'll be uh, be taking as many of those as we possibly can. So listen, we've talked um, talked a lot about the need for a good decision making framework, and Steve, you put that up as you know basically number one, and, and I think that's incontrovertible. I think where we're where the discussion is coming around is in terms of the the nature of that framework and and how explicit are the value judgments and trade offs which are being made within it, and so. Um, so Paul, it's probably a, a, a challenge for you, but happy for anybody else to, to pick it up. Um, perhaps Steve, turn to you first um, before Paul comes in to on the, ch the, the challenge you Hannah has put on the master number. So does the master number facilitate good decision making, uh, whatever good decision making is, or does it actually mask those uh, those trade offs, those value judgments, um, by giving it the um, so high those controversial choices and then giving it that privileged position as a decision making tool. I think you said it circumvents um, public debate and dem democratic decision making. So are we correct to pursue the search for the master number as a holy grail of good decision making uh, to improve uh, the life of, of people in society? Or are we utterly misguided to do so? Steve. Well, I wouldn't say we'd be utterly misguided because I think the reality of where we are at the moment is we've seen that we've, we're not even doing the checklists that Paul's uh -huh. proposed. You know, we've ended up with absolutely, well, to my 
to my mind, cataclysmic in some cases, tunnel vision on the one issue of the disease. I mean, yeah. I went to a, to a nursery school and primary school on Friday and I'm meeting, you know, two year old children there. And, you know, they've barely socialised in their first two years of life. And I remember from looking at work on early intervention that that's when, yeah. you know, brain formation is really important. So the fact that they haven't socialised, you know, I don't, don't think we can begin to imagine how serious that that potentially could be. So I, I think that having a master number um, would be probably a step, potentially a step forward. But I would say that I thought Johanna's critique was absolutely outstanding and I learned a great deal yeah. from it. I'm going to go back to the uh, paper and I would just say I wouldn't mind having the slides because um, I can certainly see that a good row between Paul and Johanna would probably result in quite a good framework that I would approve of. I'll just take this moment also to just say Nancy put up that map. And of course, you, 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 I'm sure you recognise what I'm about to say, and it's not a criticism, but it's one of the things that's a constant refrain from me. I immediately identified Buckinghamshire. I represent Wickham in South Buckinghamshire. And on your map, Wickham, uh, Buckinghamshire rather, looks really like it's doing quite well. And one of my long-term sores is if you come to Micklefield or Bowardine, Oak Ridge and Castlefield in Wickham, you will find plenty of people who really aren't doing very well at all and could do with a lot of help. I mean, schools where 80 percent of the children have English as a second language, you know, and so on. Uh, whereas if you went to Penn and Tyler's Green, you would find some quite well off, uh, quite secure upper middle class people. And if you went to Hambledon Valley, you might find some of the richest people in the country. And, I, and, and one of my big worries is that if we look at county level well-being, and I've spoken too long, but if we look at county level well-being, we obscure real suffering. And, and, and I would say even just accepting the entire framework of state power and technocracy and so on as it is, not wishing to go too far, we at least need to get down to the mid-level super output areas to, to think about where there's suffering, because otherwise we're just going to forget people in Micklefield and I represent them, I can't let that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Paul, what you Yeah, so uh, I think... The summary of what I would say is that is that sort of classic line about it being the, the journey, not the destination. I think having the master number, if you want to call it that, as the, as the final objective, whether you actually get there or not, it's kind of not actually really the main point. It's the process by which you have the discussion, that you flash out, that you flash out, flash out the different parameters that would go into that master number. It reminds me a lot of the quality days back in my early incarnation as a health thing as a health economist and we you know just drawing the doctor's attention to the idea that what they ought to be doing should be to improve people's quality of life as those individuals experience it and improve length of life was it was in itself a game changer because until then they were just doing many things that they just knew were good for people so so i think i think flushing it out is actually really really significant i think sometimes we can focus attention on that final consequence the master number and have a disagreement about that without having realized that there's a lot of places that we can agree along the way um so that would be that would be that would be one observation and, and within that of course will be the processes by which we reach the decision um the participatory democracy the the you know sort of checklist all these things that will engage populations in a discussion about what the final consequence should look like so it, it sometimes I think academics are very often guilty of this, of paying attention to the thing that is important for their academic disciplines, but not actually what is really substantively important for public policy. Um, on the distributional considerations, just very quickly, I have a paper with Kate Laffin and Alina Velias where we try to uh, identify clusters of people that are doing well and badly based on the ONS data. Because, of course, it's not just whether they're poor. It's not just whether they're in poor health. It's the fact that they're poor and they're in poor health. And so we identify different clusters of people. And I think when you do that, you can start identifying those people that are the most, well, well the people whose well-being, as those individuals experience their lives, are the worst. And whatever our political views, um, we will all agree that public policy should be best directed at improving the welfare of the worst off. Okay, um, Nancy, do you want to do you want to come in? And then, uh, Johanna, I'm going to ask you if there is your there is to respond to their responses to the challenge that I ventriloquised for you. 
I just want to just pick up some of the points that were made about distribution. So we're looking at um, how we're doing as a nation, individuals and communities. So that's also looking at distribution within places as well as with it across the nation as well. So I think Steve's point is well made is actually there's distributional issues within an area or a constituency that people are working in. And I also wanted to pick up this idea that you need to be talking about living well across the whole of life. And so you can live well at all stages of your life, whether you've got a long term, we can see that you can have the same long term condition, health condition, but have very varying qualities of life within that. And that's really quite important when we're thinking about um, how the, 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 the length and quality of people's lives. And I think that's really important as we've got more long term conditions and people living longer with them. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah, great. Uh, thanks for this. So um, on this thought that it's the journey that matters, I guess I fully agree that if um, focus on the master number makes us look at a greater diversity of potential outcomes that produce that checklist, that that is definitely an, an improvement. But as the journey is different depending on what the what the end goal is. And what I'm worried about, I guess, is that if the end goal is supposed to be producing a tool for policymakers, then a lot of the interesting discussions on the journey there are discussions that are being had between academics, essentially. I mean, there's so much interesting discussion, say, on um, uh, what do you do when there's differences between people's momentary reports of, of, um, of their life experience and sort of more longer term ones. There are all these very detailed questions about um, hedonic measures of well-being that are mostly had between scientists and not out in the open. Um, and I think if the goal were, as I've suggested, to inform public debate, where then questions of trade-offs and how different considerations should be aggregated are made in the open, that that is just politics. Um, and we want to equip uh, the participants, uh, participants in that public debate with um, social scientific resources. That's a different goal from producing a tool of aggregation for policymakers and the journey to that might look different uh, differently. We might say um, social scientists, when they see there's an interesting value question that changes the nature of our metric, that then the approach shouldn't be, let's have that discussion between us, but it should be, well, let's construct different metrics um, and, um, and make them available um, to decision makers um, rather than try and settle the, the disagreement between us. Okay, listen, we've got there's so many questions coming in and, and even just the responses to the question we just had, I'll merit it at the entire panel themselves. But I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to turn to some of the questions which are are coming in. And we've got a, a sort of group of questions around just the term well-being. And I and I, I think we probably do need to ground ground this for those who are relatively new to this debate. So Ariel Mali asks, you know, is well-being a meaningful term? Uh, and Magda Orpah is asking, well, would it not be more useful, beneficial to, to break the term down, for example, to look at well-being in the workplace or well-being in, in different facets of one's life? So can we just have just some thoughts around the justification for this sort of totalizing goal, I suppose, of well-being, whether that's, that's a meaningful term even within itself, exercise within itself? Paul, do you want to kick off? You'd probably yeah, can I have a, can have a quick go at that? Okay, so... No, I, I, I sort of said this in various ways many times, you know, two and a half thousand years of ethical discourse have managed to, you know, kind of answer this. So we're not going to do it in the next two and a half minutes. But um, I think we should put subject for, for the purposes of the discussion that we're having and the purposes yeah. of the papers that were written for this particular symposium um, or whatever we want to call it, the report that's been put out recently, then subjective well-being would be the more accurate description because it's a, a report, however measured, of how someone's feeling or how someone's life is going. Um, and I think that the subjective bit is really significant because it, it gives legitimacy, authority and voice to the experiences of those who are affected by policy. See, often it's interesting because often people will say about happiness measures, for example, oh, they're just subjective. I'd be like, well, that's the whole point. All of our experiences of life are just subjective. Um, you know, I use an analogy of having tattoos. I have a few, and people ask me whether they hurt. But I was like, well, I have no idea whether they're going to hurt you or not. Um, the experience of pain is different 
for each individual. It's the experience of pain that matters, not the tattoo itself. And I think public policy has traditionally and for a very long time focused on objective measures, things that we know to be good for people's lives without proper inquiry into whether they are or not. And economics has been largely predicated on increasing income to allow people to satisfy more of their individual preferences. We don't think that income matters per se. Income matters because it allows people to buy more stuff and do more things. Um, with the assumption that the buying of more stuff and doing more things makes people better off. Subjective well-being allows us proper and scientific inquiry into whether those things that policymakers deem to be good for people or the things that they desire for themselves actually show up in making people's lives go better for themselves. And I think that whatever our views of two and a half thousand years of ethical discourse, placing subjective well-being measures alongside those other measures is a significant advance. So we now have data that will allow us to do exactly that. Okay, Nancy, did you want to come in? Yes, I, I mean, we have this a lot. People um, uh, have a very, some people have a precondition of what well-being is. And actually there's quite a broad range of what those things are. Um, and partly because we've got an industry around things that help keep us well, and often they're called well-being and, and they're targeted at different people. And actually it's quite great that we've got businesses that can make money after keeping us well right um but there is a, there's a people do think it's fluffy and i think it i think we've shown today that it really is not but we are talking about other than aspect of quality of life as we've measured it the other question was about different domains of well-being and mm. i think this has proliferated so there's there's more those financial well-being the different types of well-being that are, uh, happen physical well-being mental well-being um I, I think this is a fine as a term i think they're all inputs into this overall well-being but um it's about being being um doing well rather than looking just at what's wrong in an area so it's, it's sort of just looking at debt it's looking at whether we've got the ability to afford the things that we need in life and whether we've got um a sufficient savings to fall back on and things like that so those terms and the domains just means um looking at the positive and what we're aiming towards rather than just looking at the negatives in those domains but there's lots of ones um i can probably name a list of about 20 different areas of well Okay, uh, again, a whole series of issues then arise there as to whether we've got, uh, you know, the kind of numbers and the, and the data and, and the balancing within each one of those areas, but also across them. So one of the, another sort of set of questions are distilling around the issue. Um, the way that I would characterize my question would be to what extent does, you know, well-being came out of health economics? Does it translate across into different policy domains? So, um, so there's one, a very good question which has come in in terms, so there are a number of people who are sort of going around this, this sort of issue as to, well, how totalizing can this be? Um, and we have a question which is really around, well, two questions, one which looks at us about the New Zealand uh, well-being approach to its uh, budget, where they actually take a capital approach. So it's looking at um, function of human capital, social capital, natural capital, um, uh, and economic or produced capital and thinking about well to what extent are our policies furthering any one of those uh, different capitals so you're you're looking across those kind of policy domains and another question which is related to that which is you know thinking about how can we be thinking about well-being in terms of for example ecological uh, ecological policies and climate policies or in relation to inequality as well as in relation to individual kind of distributional concerns or individual uh, satisfaction so so there's a group of questions there around does well-being travel outside of the health domain where it really came from and how does it really help tackle some of those other issues in relation to, for example, there might be social structure related issues or there might be environmental issues. Okay, um, Steve, off you go. Thank you. So just thinking practically, I hope people won't mind if I sort of selfishly put it in my own context. Imagine, it seems most unlikely at the moment, but imagine a, a Prime Minister asked me to be Chief Secretary to the Treasury and I would say yes, and then I'd be responsible for a spending review. And the sort of trade-offs I might have to make be the one like, like, like all right, let's not use testing on H on uh, COVID. Let's say HS2 versus um, a livable basic amount in universal credit. 
And I would really love to be able to look at those two policy areas and say, well, how much well-being do I think that the HS2 will generate? Now, I, I mean, the search, this master number is, a, it, you know, we've had a brilliant critique of that. But, you know, I, I, you'd have to make these real trade-offs between mm. travelling a bit faster to Birmingham, a verse, which costs billions of pounds, versus um, making people on, on, on UC better able to make decent civilised choices uh, and better motivated them into work. So, you know, within that framework, at the moment, I, I'm afraid I think spending reviews are much more about horse trading and politics and much less about any kind of, even if it's imperfect, uh, objective analysis of the effect of trade-offs on the public. So, you know, I'll be, make no secret of it. If I was Chief Secretary, I'd want to get spending down so we could balance the books and lower taxes. But I'd like to get spending down in a way which was civilised and humane and which I could honestly justify as being... Um, you know, pursuing moral ends by moral means, but uh, I'm in danger of making a speech, so I'll stop. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you. And the question about the um, the interconnections on human health, I couldn't find the questioner's name, but it's Vicky Asavera uh, from New Zealand. In fact. Um, so, so, so let's Johanna, Nancy, Paul, about thinking about these interconnections across um, these different policy domain areas. And to what extent well-being enables us to to think about the trade-offs in those yeah, wider so, issues. So I think if you if you conceptualize subjective well-being as you know something related to the experiences of someone's uh, life, to their to, to what they do with their time, to who they spend that time with, um, to what they pay attention to, um, you then see all of these other determinants as sort of right-hand side variables in a regression equation, i.e. the things that really significantly affect how people think and feel about life. Um, and what it enables you to do, I think, is to think about policy in a more complete way, for sure, but also potentially to break down some of the silos that exist across departments. Because if, if you think, for example, you know, relationships, which have been to some large degree decimated over the last two years, um, are a significant determinant of an individual's well-being and actually also how long people live. Um, loneliness, for example, you know, is one of the biggest causes of people dying prematurely. So you would recast policy discussions about the big determinants, the things that significantly affect well-being, and you might, as a result of that, reorganise departments um, in ways that address the significant factors that affect individual and social well-being so i think um in a similar way in a similar way to the way the qualities have enabled us to think about healthcare interventions that affect pain mobility self-care usual activities anxiety depression and so on we might think about public policies in terms of the impacts it has on the half a dozen key determinants of an individual's welfare just picking up from what paul said there we can see the impacts of policies outside of the health department on subjective wellbeing metrics, whether they are um, energy efficiency for low income homes, whether they are a sport or culture intervention or a social relationships ones, loneliness is the one that Paul's mentioned, but also families, which again, doesn't have a home in fact, it's in DWP. So all of these things that you can see impact uh, well, and the, what, what the well-being measures able you to do is enable you to have a sort of currency across those different departments with the varying different degrees of impact. It's not going to be the only metric you use or the only reason a department will choose to put forward a policy. I think where the subjective well-being measures struggle a little bit more is in relation to the environment and the future well-being. So when we're talking and the argument that well-being has only come from health economics, I don't think is true. I think lots of different disciplines have claimed to that well-being area, and a lot of it has come from the environmental side or has come from new public management and things like that. So, um, and this capital's approach as well. So 
it, arguably it's um, uh, each of the different disciplines have got to sort of work out what they all share mean about it. I think environment, I think it really struggles with. When we're talking about well-being in the framework use of the word, um, it's looking at how we're doing as individuals, as communities and as a nation and how sustainable that is for the future. And that is where the capitals come in, which is this, what is this stocks and flows and risk and resilience and our ability to manage that? How dig are we deep? how deep are we going into our reserves to manage a particular situation? How do we build that up so that the volunteering response is ready in that time of crisis, even though we can't immediately see that impact now? And things like um, ability to deal with prevention and promotion of things that keep us well. Someone's asked about the, the health inequalities in the Q&A. Things that keep us well are often outside the health department. And, and the things that um, help us with economic growth will not always be in the economic department. So this helps us look across government much more effectively. But there are still challenges, particularly around the environmental side, that I don't think it quite picks up yet. On the uh, New Zealand question, so if I understand it, correctly what it reports on is various different dimensions across them uh, which there might be policy effects and I think one of the advantages of that kind of um, approach is that it leaves us more flexible to make policy what matters in policy um, depend on context so we might want that in cases where say different um, kinds of policy have different stakeholders and potentially we want to give more weight um, to them and the problem with this, with this sort of master number approach is that it might not allow for that kind of con context sensitivity. And likewise, time might change how much weight we want to give to different dimensions. Maybe political majorities change over time as um, people's opinions change, as the um, makeup of the population changes. And, and I think this kind of um, dashboard approach might have an advantage um, in, in that regard. Interesting. Steve. Yeah, so I want to pick up on actually on one of the issues that came up in, in your responses to that question, and particularly Nancy, you, you pulled it out, but Steve, it actually touches on something you talked about right at the beginning, which is intergenerational justice. And Charlie Hicks got in really early, okay, with his question, which hits particularly on this, which came in actually, Paul, at the time when you were talking about people putting up their hands, right? They're kind of, you know, jumping up. And he asked, how can younger people and people not yet born raise their hand higher to get a greater claim for public resources in the current political voting system? Um, but I wouldn't just beyond the current political voting system, even in that jumping up to put up your hand, how can younger people and those not yet born be oh. raising their hand or have their hand raised? So how do we then play this into the issue, Steve, that you raised right at the outset of inter intergenerational justice? Gosh, so this is one of those issues that's so large, it's almost difficult to know where to uh, begin. I mean, um, uh, we've obviously got to represent the as yet unborn, and I think actually most people do care about their descendants. And mm -hmm. one of the cases I would like us very much to make is an appeal to grandparents and parents that one of the things we are obliged to do as politicians is create a better and more hopeful future uh, for, for, the, for the, you know, their living children and grandchildren. And because in particular, I think about social care. You know, when you look... So I don't want to diverge too much, but if you look for the, at the Office for Budget Responsibilities fiscal sustainability forecasts, they, they all you know, diverge off to enormous debt levels, which clearly are not sustainable. In the 2018 uh, forecast, the OBR said of, of, of debt levels of about the sort of 200 to 300 percent of GDP level, they said something like clearly that won't happen because clearly policy will have to change. Well, what they meant by that was in our lifetimes, we'll default on pension, health care. Uh, education, everything, welfare, all, all these obligations will default on them because clearly we can't run to those debt levels. So that, that should challenge us all. So um, I've lost my thread now. Where were we? What, we, what was the main point? Inter intergenerational justice. Intergenerational justice. So how do we, so, yes, so how do we think about the intersubjective well-being yeah. um, of those not yet born, not yet able yeah. to have well-being? So, so when we look ahead at those kind of age related spending promises that we don't think are going to be kept according to the OBR, we're obviously not going to keep them by raising national insurance on working age people. How can then the question becomes to your point about raising hands higher, how can working age people protest? Of course, the irony is that one of the best ways of them protesting a Conservative government doing it, if I may say so, is to spend £25 a year joining the Conservative Party, because <laughs> nah. to be honest, 
Yeah, but forgive me, but this is one of the things people do. It's a public, it's a straight up public choice thing. Even join join the political party of your choice. But you know, if you want to be the MP for Wickham, you've got to get selected as the candidate. And that's typically done by about a hundred people. And so if you're a party member, you have dramatically more power to express your voice than if you're an elector just once every five years in a general election. And, and this is one of the great sicknesses in our democracy that we don't talk about. People aren't joining particularly any of the parties with perhaps the exception of Corbyn Easters. And, and, and the result is a sickness in our whole democracy and our whole body politic. And unless there's a plentiful supply of candidates and a plentiful supply of party members to choose amongst candidates, it's very difficult to see how these hands get raised high because uh, frankly, it's too late once you're an elector every five years. I mean, there's all okay. sorts of public consultation, but that, I'm Fair afraid enough. it's a very practical point. No, absolutely. But I think we're, we're, in, we're in danger of going into a, another, ex, a, another equally fascinating panel, actually, on the state of our democracy, which I, yeah. I think we can, it's such a big topic, we can definitely raise that for a whole series of panels. Paul? Yeah, no, I just wanted to just, just draw attention to the survivorship bias which people will be mm -hmm. familiar with in terms of business right so when you walk down a high street you see successful businesses you think every business is but of course you don't notice the ones that go bust um and the survivorship bias applies really strongly to age mm -hmm. um because when we look at of course at older people we look at older people and notice them but we don't see all the ones that have died along the way um and we, are, we have done things over the last couple of years, I wanted to bring it back to COVID at least for a moment, that would have shortened the life experiences and life expectancies of those who had the least to begin with. Um, and so something about the process of making policy is broken. Um, we need something, and you know, Steve was talking about that from a party political perspective, and, and, and I completely agree with all of that. There's something about the ethical discourse. I know, I mean, I, I know that academics talk about this, but if you go to talk to, one of the things that I am very confident about, and we've actually gathered empirical data during the course of the pandemic to support this too, is that most people actually, as a common sense conception of justice by the fairness argument. Mm. Um, so why did it never play into policy discussions at any point? There's something very interesting about that. There's something, there's a market failure. There's a political failure. There's a failure in the system to allow conversations of a difficult kind to take place um and so i just pose that as a question not as an answer mm -hmm. but um i i there's a, there's a lot that politicians can do i think there's other issues as well that we can discuss where the public mood and public sentiment is actually probably more on the side of the people that would say something that on the face of it sounds controversial <laughs> than than is actually the case there's often maybe a little bit too much risk aversion and caution amongst the politicians mm. nancy just picking up this future generations bit and how you can um, the, the welfare, the welfare and well-being consideration in spending decisions applies to the whole population, not just mm -hmm. taxpayers. So that is, includes children, young people. And of course, children, young people now are our future well-being as a nation. And um, we know that the well-being of young people at 14 can predict their well-being uh, as adults uh, and is predictive up to eight years before. So we can see this wave um, happening. Um, and what we can see, I think there's a, there was a question here about sort of getting more local data and fantastic, that would be brilliant, getting get lower data, but also um, improving. We've got good national statistics on children and people's well-being, but actually they're not as good as the adult ones. Um, and I think we, we have a lot of arguments about how young people are doing during a pandemic, but we don't have enough data to know actually how they're doing. There's been some improvements in that, but that's our future well-being as well, is, the, is measuring the children and young people who are our future well-being as a nation. Sorry, just to, just, I mean, we do know that the thousands of children have gone completely missing from school. Like we don't need subjective well-being measures that that had a significant effect. And where was the situation when we were situationally blind to those issues? Where in the processes of policy making was anybody thinking about or taking account of the impact on those individuals? Aren't uh, nowhere. And so as we as we move out of the pandemic, as we have the public inquiry that will follow, these are the kinds of questions that ought to be being asked by that public inquiry. Mm -hmm important point to note for anybody right in terms of reference to that public inquiry um seriously johanna 
your thoughts on this issue? Really, really thought a difficult issue. Oh, but you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, um, had to happen at least once during any panel. Um, uh, I guess this is, I mean, this is one of the advantages of the bringing in well-being into these discussions, I think, um, especially when it comes to the to the pandemic um, of moving away from just looking at deaths to looking at well-being does focus the attention more on young people, especially when we talk about um, lifetime well-being. Um, one of the features of, of Paul's account, if I understand it, would be that actually we give a lot more weight to what happens with young people because they have a lot more life ahead of them. So I think in that regard, it refocuses the discussion to something important. Excellent. Yeah, just to, sorry, just to clarify that as well. You, no, you're absolutely right because they have a lot more ahead of them. But that's yeah. the utilitarian characters. But they've, but they have had, but they have had less already behind them. And I think that's the that's the nature of the fair innings argument. It's, it accounts for not just prospectively what's going forward, but retrospectively how much you've had. Um, I think that that's the more complete help. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so listen, I think there's there's a lot that we could be pursuing in in that theme, and and I just want to to raise the challenge for somebody to pick up at some point um, for which was prompted by something that you said, and it would be and this is a challenge out to everybody who's uh, to listening as well as the panel, not necessarily for now. What would our what would our machinery of government look like? If we were to reorganize our departments around principles of well-being and we were to organize our decision-making frameworks our equivalent of the green book and the red book and all of those other different things uh, not around cbas and impact but around well-being impact analysis so but at least what would our machinery of government look like okay for another time not necessarily you might want to come in later um, but we have also a host of questions which are actually around thinking about the principles that we've been talking about, but putting them in the private sector context. Okay, so how do, how, for example, uh, would businesses be thinking about, be thinking about well-being? So we've got a question, and how would this play into, into different sectors? Now, um, there is a specific question from um, Deborah Dean, good long-standing friend and colleague of mine, um, on the financial services context. I know that you might not be particularly familiar with that, but I'll ask you about that, but also then bring in some of the other questions which come in about how employers and businesses might think about this. So her, her question is, how does wellbeing translate into a commercial relationship? So for example, financial services uh, requiring firms to put the customer's interests at the center of their business. Um, and how can that uh, possibly be realistic and practical um, when they've got their commercial interest at heart. But we've also got a question which is a bit more general, which is asking, well, listen, if you've got employers trying now to think about workplace well-being, managing their workforces, et cetera, how can they take some of the principles that we're talking about here and put that into, into practice in, in that commercial context? Steve. Thank you. I'll just make um, two points. Um, the first is that we do have ESG, you know, investing and so on going on. And so in a sense, there's already a big experiment in this area going on. And I suppose there's another panel to be had about how well it's working and whether it's the right thing and whether in principle, um, in, you know, it, it is the right thing to do. In a sense, it's slightly usurping entrepreneurial function. And there's a big um, epistemological question to be had about whether that's right and so on. But there's a, there's, so there's a big question panel discussion to be had there, but I'd just put that on the table and not, not try and go into it uh, uh, too much. And the other point I'd make is that, you know, Adam Smith is best known not for the theory of moral sentiments. And it, it's rather a pity, I think, because actually, while toxic cultures and bad behaviour, of course, arise, and we mustn't be naive about it, I do think that the vast majority of people actually are quite happy to go to work and do a good and interesting and important job which serves other people. And I think most of us get fulfilment out, out of doing that. And um, you know, there's plenty of jobs we can be, uh, people can be proud to do. You know, I had a great chat with the guy who cleans the offices because he'd seen me on the TV and we stopped and we talked about it. And I'm glad he looks after me and I'm glad to stop and talk with him. You know, it's and, and we can all be proud that we've served one another in small and big ways. So, so um, I, I think there's a balance here between not wishing to be naive, but accepting that actually human nature is quite good, but then actually accepting that there is a giant experiment in this area in progress. Nancy. So we know there's about four things in this area that I can think of immediately at the top of my head. So 
we know that one of the biggest, most robust findings in the wellbeing economics literature is the importance of employment and creating and providing jobs and good jobs at that, um, that are interesting, uh, rewarding, um, great colleagues around you uh, and making a difference. And with training and all of those things that keep us going in life, I mean, 25% of people said that work was one of the things that helped them cope during the pandemic. And um, it's one of the things that we've worked really, really hard to protect, which is jobs as well, because there's a lifelong scarring effect or, 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 of uh, long term unemployment. Um, so jobs and good jobs are, the, uh, are big ones. Um, but knowing there is a good question about um, the things that employers are doing uh, about improving well-being of their staff and whether or not they're effective, which is a slightly different question. But actually, there's also um, the impact that the product and service that they provide has on the well-being of the nation. And actually, many businesses have had a big impact on the well-being of the nation. And you can start to look at that. Some regulators have started to look at some of the mm -hmm. impacts of, so, for example, the utilities. Uh, water, for example, or, or on on the um, products and so on the impact of mm. well-being, and also the the contribution they make in the places that they're in through the the, the, the CSR that they do, the the pro bono support that they provide to a whole range of different organisations. So there's a, a just a, a handful of ways that businesses mm. make a difference. Fantastic, thanks. Nice. Um, can I have a quick? Yes, I just yeah, just, okay. a, just a couple of quick. Reflections following on from what both Steve and Nancy said, I think it's one of the reasons why we should be very suspect or very questioning or whatever, suspicious of universal basic income. Um, I think we um, we should be thinking of ways in which people can engage in meaningful work, which is not always high status jobs. Um, I draw attention now to my second book. If I've ever done the first one. Let's get people to read Happy Ever After. Um, very weakly associated uh, uh, effects of well-being and the status of the job. It speaks to what Nancy said about having good people to work with, for seeing the fruits of your labour, uh, feeling like you're working for a point, for a purpose, to have meaning. Um, there's nothing worse than feeling like your work is futile and pointless, irrespective of how much you might be remunerated for it. Um, and so there are very important lessons for employers about how to improve employee um, well-being. Um, and also, I guess to say that even if you didn't care about well-being, if you thought it was a, a woolly, soft and subjective concept, that it's causally predictive of all of the things that we would want for society, including healthy, productive workers. So, um, of course, I care about it as a final consequence. But even if you didn't, uh, it has a very important causal effect on all of the other things that we want from society. Okay, excellent. Um, so we've got, so I'm not, um, to be honest, we, we're going to be struggling to get through all of the questions, but I think we are hopefully touching on some of the themes that are coming up in most of them. Um, but one, one which keeps recurring um, is, well, and Ilza van der Hoven, I'm just going to, Ilza, I'm just going to pull out your articulation of this, which is, is this, I suppose, the differentiation between GDP and economic growth and whether I suppose well-being just collapses back down into into economic growth, whether it gives us any any meaningful purchase um, on on issues and, and, and what a public policy would look like. Uh, if we use the well-being matrix metric master number approach as a differentiating factor, I think people are still some are still kind of struggling with that to envisage what that would look like. Well, in relation to economic growth, I mean, leaving the master number issue to one side, but I mean, mm. poverty makes people miserable, but being rich doesn't make them happy. We should, you know, there's a very, very strong association between well-being and income at lower levels uh, because of the attention that is drawn to the lack of resources. Um, if you're if you're worrying about paying attention to how you pay pay the bills, feed the kids, and so on, then it's you know obviously going to be misery making. But I see income a little bit like a referee in a football game. Mm -hmm. You know, when you watch, for those that, I apologise for those that don't like football, but for, for, for uh, well, I don't actually, because you should. Um, but um, we often say that the ref's had a good game when he's not been noticed. It's normally he, sometimes she. When, when, when they've not been noticed. And, and I think income is like that in our lives. When you're not paying attention to it, you've probably got the right amount, right? So when you're poor, you're paying attention to it because you can't pay the bills for the kids. Actually, when you get super rich, you're really worried about whether you 
got the right investments, right portfolios, right stocks and shares. You're panicking about how you compare to other people. Um, there's, there is a sweet spot um, somewhere in the middle where you have just enough. And, and we need to move away from this kind of addiction almost, which it is like an addiction of more pleas to a narrative of just enough. Very difficult to do that individually, of course. You can't, you can't just you know, choose that for yourself. It's very hard to choose that for yourself. If you, if you were to take a job, if I were to, to leave the LSE, heaven forbid, and go and take a job somewhere else and paid less money, everyone would think I was mad. If I went and you know, got paid more somewhere else, which obviously many other institutions do pay more than the LSE, um, then uh, people would they're say- They're not well, really as nice places to work for. They're not well, really exactly. I was, gonna come to the purpose, I was gonna come to the purpose point, if you'd let me finish. But no, anyway, so you know, I'd have to tell a story. It, it, it would be easier to justify it taking a higher paying job than it is to take a lower paying one because that narrative of accumulation of more is so powerful. Um, and so we can't do that individually. It requires a collective action problem. We can't individually swim, swim against the tide. And then it requires legislation, it requires policy makers, it requires to speak to the earlier point about climate change. It requires us to invest in you know, capital markets and in assets. Um, that's, that's, that's actually where you know, much of the mitigation policies will, you know, come from, um, is from the investment in the right kinds of capital and assets. So I think all these, many of these issues are actually intertwined, uh, but, but they require, at the very first point, this does go back to the individual level, mm. it requires an acceptance on the part, anyone who's been any form of therapy, whatever, will know that the first step to behaviour change is acceptance. And we need to accept as individuals and as a society that our constant addiction to consumption and accumulation is actually not in our individual and in our social interest, but it requires us to first really honestly, truly accept that. Another thoughts on, on that issue? I mean, yeah. with GDP, I guess in one sense, it is a, a kind of master number, but in, one of the things that I guess dis uh, distinguishes it is that it's not pretending to also take into account equality, that it, it was sort of always clear that we have to measure inequality in income sort of separately from the GDP number. Um, and so in, in that respect, it's I think the, the claim to comprehensiveness is quite, not quite as big as um, when it comes to well-being uh, well measures. Enough. So we've got um we've got a, a question which circles back round to this question of metrics again. Um, and this one is from Rory Tierney, who's a health pharmacist at um, Department of Health and Social Care. And he asks, what does a good decision-making process with much more quantified consequences look like? Is it akin to a multi-criteria decision analysis where decision makers select the sector of me metrics they care about the most and weight them explicitly? And it goes back to the, the question as to whether there's the single um, well-bees, et cetera, the aggregate of skills on the value judgments. We've, we've argued about the second point, but I just, in terms of thinking about this now in practical policy terms. So Steve, you talked about your, the checklist, the, pause, the, the idea of the checklist. Uh, Hani, you've talked about really being very explicit about the weighting that are given to different sets of metrics. So how would we, how do we start to operationalize a, a well-being decision-making process framework what would that look like yeah well, i mean the first thing is that a prime minister has got to decide that they want to do it and make decisions better well, and they, should, they, sh they shouldn't be waiting for the judge-led inquiry i mean i think this is one of the extraordinary things that we've learned in the course of this crisis which, which i know paul and i've discussed at length publicly and privately but you know it would be a good start to just have a list of 20 things that the cabinet should be thinking about before they lock down society and paul's provided a convenient list you know people will wish to add to it but it, it, it's extraordinary as i mentioned earlier perhaps indiscreetly you know matt hancock and i had the conversation i think i, I forget if i said it on this call or in the comments but you know we had the conversation and they're relying on the prime minister to do it on the hoof in the meeting and that's ridiculous so at the moment the framework is it, it feels to me so bad that a good start would be the simple things. And then really a prime minister needs to commission, um, you know, some excellent experts. And, you know, I think the people on this call would be a good start to, to actually sit down and say, well, this is how you'd really do it. And, mm. you know, actually, as I said at the beginning, listening to Joanna critique Paul, I, I think the two of them would, would if, if forced to do it in a week, not you know, that you're academic, so I wouldn't give you too long. 
<laughs> but I might, I might give you a week or two and say, come up with something. And that's how I'd start to operationalise it. Uh -huh. um, but it, nothing would get done in government unless the Prime Minister tells the Cabinet Office to get it done. Yeah. No, for sure. So, Paul, just so uh, Steve has, has rightly mentioned your checklist uh, of 20 things, but I'm conscious that, that people on the, on the call and listening in might not be familiar with it. So do you want to just give us some of the key highlights? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't. It's, it's, it was just simply that um, uh, just to just can I just very give just give a little bit of context because <laughs> But I just want to say it's because you know, I think it's a important show, everybody. <laughs> oh, has he got it? Yeah. Um, because of the situational blindness, when you're paying attention to what's in front of you and not what is necessarily substantively important, we know that checklists have been really, really effective yeah. in the airline industry and surgical operating theatre. So that's why they're so that's why they're so fundamentally important. They draw us away from what we what we pay attention to in that moment to what really substantively matters. And it has very obvious things on it like the displaced healthcare impacts. Shall I, shall I, shall I came through and read, since I've got it in front of me, shall I came through and yeah. not do all 20, but so patients with COVID-19, which is where the tunnel vision has been, patients displaced by those with COVID-19 who have often been forgotten, particularly on my side of the argument, although not by me, patients who don't attend hospital when they should have done, fear of COVID and health related concerns, so physical health, divorce, civic participation, I'm skimming some environmental road quality, road accidents might have gone down, he mental health, addictions, loneliness, child welfare, domestic violence, and several uh, measures of inequality. So that, that's a quick scan down the list. Fantastic. So I think what we've got there is, um, a, you know, a challenge then I suppose would be to be thinking about the appropriate checklist, because that's a specific to the COVID obviously response. But what would that, what would be on that checklist? Or if it was to be this global, if we've got a global goal, totalizing goal, the goal, note the, the title of the, of the session is the goal of public policy, not just a goal of public policy. Uh, if we've got a set of totalizing metrics, um, not perhaps a single master number, but perhaps they might build up into one or, or series, um, what would be the checklist uh, that will be supporting, as it were, the, the globalizing um, approach, as it were, uh, to pursuing uh, well-being as, as the public policy goal uh, that we're thinking about and how would we organize our machinery of government uh, to consider that and deliver that we have two minutes <laughs> so you'll be delighted to know can That's i shoot me the subset the subject of a, a series of a whole new series of events uh, and podcasts that we could be going through but if i can shoot if I can shoehorn myself in there, the machinery of government point is so important and mm -hmm. public choice factors because government departments, as people on this call will know, operate as fiefdoms and only think about their own interests. And they're far too big and far too powerful to do that. So there is definitely a place for LSE experts in you know, organisational dynamics and management theory and indeed the structure of government to, to work with social scientists who are really on the detail to, to work out well, what you, would you propose to a prime minister? I'd be fascinated mm -hmm. to see it. Excellent. Right, final, final thoughts, anybody, on any aspect of what the vast range of issues and ground that we've, discovered, we've covered this evening. May I just make this literally just one yeah. quick comment about diversity of perspective in decisions? Yes. That's all I want. So that's really all I want to say, simply okay. that. Because we have we have had a pandemic response that has been governed by the zoomocracy um, of by by a particular class of person, literally uh, of a certain demographic, um, and the ability to to work from home relatively comfortably. Um, and I think that that is and, and, and actually, by the way, at a time when they're facing the most existential dread. So I think all of those factors combined um, led us into a particular direction that may not have been the case had we had a broader set of perspectives involved in decision making. Excellent. Okay, Johanna, got 20 seconds. Then Nancy, also 20 seconds. Well, yes, I, I guess I agree with that point about diversity of perspectives. And I think that means we should take into account a more diverse range of perspectives than just the well-being based approach. Thank you, Nancy. So how government is organised uh, is a real challenge around wellbeing because there is no department for wellbeing, there's no minister for it, and there probably shouldn't be. But how we organise government to support this uh, is a real challenge and needs some real thought. So, for example, how do we support preventative spend when departments have an incentive to protect their own 
interest in a spending review, for example, uh, are, are the sorts of challenges we've been looking at. The other thing I wanted to pick up, and that I think the wellbeing metrics allow us to do, is to pick up the really human impacts of things like bereavement and loss and those mm. people who are left behind as well, which are not taken into account in metrics. So I think um, it has huge potential. There are some things that we can iron out, but um, I think it has potentially a constitutional changing impact uh, on, on public policy making. Fantastic. You heard it here first, folks. Changing the machinery of government to organise it around principles uh, and delivering well-being. Fantastic. So listen, it has been just a brilliant panel. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you to another LSE event very soon. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>